Hey, everybody. Welcome. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to True Crime Wednesday. For those of you who might not know me, my name is Lori Hellis. I'm a retired criminal and family attorney, and uh, I've written a book about the Daybell and Ballow case. So we are uh, um, heavy into the second week of Chad Daybell's trial. And we're gonna dive right in very quickly. Um, if you would, please like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference for creators these days. So please remember to like, and if you are happy with, with this content, please subscribe. Um, we dive deeply into some of the legal issues that are connected to the true crime cases that we follow. And uh, so we're ready to dive in. Before we dive into the Daybell case, I do have a couple of updates on a couple of other cases. For those of you that are old hands here, you know that the first half of the show, I like to sort of give you a rundown of what's been going on. And the second half, we take your questions. So if you have questions, please hold off on posting them until we ask for them because it makes it so much easier for our fabulous moderator Jen to uh, to spot them and pull them up. Um, I answer all my emails so if for some reason you're a little shy or you don't really want to post your question in the chat you can always email me or drop them in our comments. By the way um, we still have a uh, Justice for Tylee and JJ bracelets available for folks who want them. You can send me a self-addressed stamped envelope to the address that's in our show notes, and, uh, and we will send you one for free. Um, for those of you who have bracelets, please consider posting a picture of yourself wearing these one of these bracelets in your social media. Make it your your profile picture temporarily. Let's keep this case and JJ and Tylee at the forefront of people's minds as this trial goes on. So I want to talk about a couple of, of cases, just a couple of short updates. Corey Richens. Corey Richens is the mother um, from Utah who is accused of murdering her husband and then writing a children's book about grief for her two sons. Um, she has a, a, hear, a recent hearing on evidence. Um, actually, what is happening is she has a preliminary hearing coming up on May 15th. Now, for those of you who are um, might not be familiar with the, um, with the case, a uh, preliminary hearing, there are two ways that, that the prosecutor can get an indictment um, and bring the charges. One is through a preliminary hearing, the other is through a grand jury. So in this case, there is a preliminary hearing came, coming up. Now we saw a preliminary hearing in Chad Daybell's case. Um, it, the initial charges against Chad of, of um, destroying and, and uh, secreting evidence, which were the charges he was held on before the murder charges were brought, um, was brought under a preliminary hearing. And they had a two-day preliminary hearing for Chad. So we're going to see something similar on Corey Richens. States differ on whether they prefer grand juries or preliminary hearings. For instance, in Idaho, Preliminary hearings are preferable. I believe that's the case in Utah as well. Um, in other states, they prefer the grand jury process instead. One of the reasons for the preference for the grand jury process is that it is a secret process, that the, in, the information um, about the evidence that, is, that the state has against the defendant doesn't become public um, if if it's presented to a grand jury. So in the meantime, they were having hearings uh, for Corey Richens on 
um, the evidence and the exhibits that are being prepared to be presented at the preliminary hearing on May 15th. So the judge set some, uh, some deadlines when the defense has to have their exhibits in, the prosecution has to have their exhibits in. So um, uh, that'll be coming up on May 15th. Now, the Karen Reed trial in uh, Massachusetts started uh, jury selection yesterday. My understanding is they've seated four jurors, I think, already in uh, that first day. And so we're probably going to see opening statements maybe Monday or Tuesday would be my guess. Uh, I'd be surprised if it was any sooner. Um, Karen Reed's case is a case where she is accused of having backed over her boyfriend and killed him and then either accidentally or on purpose and um, having left him to die uh, in the snow in January in outside of Boston. However, um, the interesting part about that case is all of the discussion about um, law enforcement uh, corruption because the victim, John O'Keefe, was a police officer and well connected with a lot of other police officers. His body was found outside the home of a police officer. and. Um, a lot of the evidence is pretty contradictory. It is difficult to add up and doesn't all add up. And so there's been a lot, a huge move uh, in, in that area to um, hold law enforcement accountable for what appears to be corruption. Um, there is some evidence that points to John O'Keefe perhaps being um, assaulted at the home he was visiting and then thrown out into the snow and left there. Um, so that, and that's the theory that the defense is using. So that will be a very interesting case to watch. I think it's gonna be really emotionally charged. I'm sad it's going on at the same time as Daybell because I'm, I, I don't quite have enough bandwidth to keep up with both of them, but I am going to try and uh, at, at least uh, stay aware of what's going on in the Karen Reed case because that case really interests me. The last thing I wanna talk about is Brian Koberger. So today was the deadline for um, the defense to present to the, hang on, I'm pulling something up here. Uh, today was the deadline for the defense to present more details on Brian Koberger's uh, alibi. So let me just pull this up so you can take a look at this. Um, it is the, the uh, defense today, right at the last hour, has filed their uh, supplemental response to the request for an alibi defense. And it doesn't really get any better. It basically says that um, he was an avid runner and hiker and explored many of the areas of the, of the, of the Palouse. Uh, he explored a particular park that became his favorite location. Then after the school year started, he was busy. So instead of being able to go out and run and hike as he had been able to do during the day, his nighttime drives increased. And so it says it support. this is supported uh, by data from his phone showing him in the countryside late at night or early in the morning on several occasions. The phone data includes photographs taken on different late evenings and early mornings. Um, he liked to hike and run or see the moon and the stars. And so he says that the witness, because they've been saying that they had a corroborating witness, the witness is uh, Cy Ray, a CSLI ex 
experts, cell tower, cell phone, and other radio frequency uh, expert to show that his mobile device was uh, located south of Pullman, Washington and west of Moscow. And so his car could not have been the vehicle captured on video along the Moscow Pullman Highway near Floyd's cannabis shop. Um, additional information as to Mr. Koberger's whereabouts as the early morning hours progressed, including additional analysis from Mr. Ray, will be provided once the state provides the discovery requested and now subject to an upcoming motion to compel. So they are still arguing about discovery. Go figure. Uh, this case has has been, well, it's over a year since this case started and they're still arguing about discovery. It's crazy. But um, not crazy if you have watched any of the hearings involved in the case. There was a recent hearing uh, having to do with the survey that the defense has been um, trying to get done to support their motion to change venue. And that was the first time I really saw the DA in action. And he is a piece of work. Uh, I really don't like him. And uh, so it's unsurprising to me at this point that they are sitting on discovery. It is a, a it can be a prosecutor tactic and it's crappy. So, uh, but I don't find it surprising at all considering this particular DA. I thought Ann Taylor, Brian Koberger's attorney, did an excellent job of threading, uh, of walking that type rope, of threading the needle, of being sufficiently outraged by the fact that the uh, prosecutor keeps going to the judge and asking for things on, on an emergency basis and not giving her time to respond and yet also um, sufficiently conversant in the reasons for the, the change of venue. The judge has yet to, to rule on whether or not they can continue that survey. The survey around Moscow, that, that one is done, but they wanted to do comparisons to a couple of other counties in Idaho, including Ada County, you know, where Boise is located and where the Daybell case is taking place right now. And the problem is that the judge has said these, this handful of questions having to do with, in, have you heard or, or seen media coverage of these specific things? Um, and the judge has put a stop to that, to those questions. The problem is that there's no way to compare apples to apples if the judge doesn't permit those same questions to be asked of people in the other two counties they want to use for comparisons. So the judge still hasn't ruled on that. We're still waiting to hear. And in the meantime, the case just keeps ticking along. But the interesting thing is that one of the local newspapers recently reached out to the state and asked the state how much has been spent so far on Koberger's defense. To date, $3.6 million. And we have not even gotten to the change of venue. There isn't even a trial date set. Um, and they're not going to set a trial date until the change of motion venue or the change of venue motion is heard. And that can't be heard until they sort out the issue of this survey. And, and uh, that got held up because the defense had to ask for extra time for the change to get to the change of venue motion. The reason being that the survey is on hold. And until the survey is complete, they don't have the information that the judge is going to expect them to present at a change of venue motion as to the impact that um, that the media and uh, the widespread media has had on a jury court. So that being said, 
we are still in a holding pattern. Now, I want to remind everybody that before Lori Vallow's trial ever started in Ada County, so last uh, last spring, uh, early spring, before um, Lori Vallow's trial, a year ago started, so several months before her trial started, um, the same newspaper asked for information about the cost of her prosecution. And at that point, it was $3.4 million. And they still had not even, then they hadn't even started the trial. We know that her trial costs an, about another million and a half dollars. And now we have Chad's trial. So Chad's trial is going to at least cost a million and a half dollars to, to um, put on here. We have no idea what it is cost in terms of, of uh, uh, his defense and, and of, um, uh, of any sort of investigative fees. So we don't have any uh, real idea. But we can speculate knowing what Lori's cost. We know it's going to be at least a million dollars just for the period of time that, that Chad is uh, in trial. So the death penalty is not a cheap proposition. Even after a person is found guilty and sentenced, then there will be years upon years of of appeals and millions and millions of dollars in the cost of attorney fees and appellate reviews. Um, so it's a lot. I just glanced over at the chat. I try not to because it gets me off track. Um, but I just glanced over at the chat and uh, I see that Cynthia Mark. Margretti, I'm sorry if I've butchered your name, Cynthia, um, just posted a question wanting to know if I could possibly do a simple quilting class for the Crane Square. For those of you who might be new, um, I'm a very avid quilter. Thank you, Jen. I'm a very avid quilter. Um, owned a quilt shop at one point, taught quilting classes, and um, so we've done a couple of quilts uh, at, at kind of quilt alongs as a part of our, our community. And right now we have a, 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 cla or a, a project going on where we're asking people to make what uh, a, a quilt square that looks like an origami folded crane. And those squares are going to be put together into a quilt for JJ's grandparents, Kay and Larry Woodcock. So um, the pattern is, the link to the pattern is in our show notes. And um, Cynthia is asking if I could do a simple class on how to put make the crane. It's a paper pieced uh, pattern, which is a little bit different than a lot of quilters uh, might be ac uh, acquainted with. And it is, Cynthia, it is on my to-do list, and I am going to do my very best to get that done this weekend. Here is my dilemma. My dilemma is that I'm in the middle of getting ready to move. And so a lot of things are packed up because we've been trying to show our house and, uh, you know, you have to unclutter things. So I, if I can pull out uh, enough goodies, enough supplies to do a little tutorial, I will do that. Um, otherwise, our last quilt that we did, um, which should still be in the show notes as well, um, that uh, quilt, the person who designed that quilt had some tutorials on paper piecing, and uh, that might be the quickest way to get a quick lesson on, um, it's called foundation piecing. Uh, each square should finish to be about six inches, about should finish to be six inches and should be on a black background. Um, the color that you use for the crane is completely up to you. Patterns uh, are, are acceptable. So whatever, um, 
whatever sparks you um, and um, and and speaks to honoring JJ and Tylee, please use it. Um, in Japanese culture, people often fold our origami cranes as a memorial for someone who has passed. And uh, often they say that you should you should fold a thousand origami cranes in memory of someone. So it seemed like an appropriate pattern for Tylee and JJ. So speaking of that, let's launch into Daybell trial this week. So um, I attended Monday and Tuesday. I didn't attend today because I had to get ready for you all tonight. So I followed it uh, by the live stream today. I will be back on court tomorrow and Friday, and uh, then we'll just kind of see how next week goes. Um, we are trying to keep our house ready and available to be shown anytime anybody wants to see it. So that is putting a little bit of a crimp in some of the things that I've been able to do. So um, uh, just sort of a couple preliminary things before we really jump into the witnesses that we heard um, since opening statements happened late last week. So just to dive in, I want to say, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the layout of the courtroom. And um, this courtroom is, this is the same courtroom where Lori's trial was held. And it is configured the same way that Lori's case was. So if you go to my um, newsletter archive, I do have a diagram in there from Lori's trial. But let me just set the scene. If you, when you walk in the uh, courtroom door, there are three sections of basically pews, benches, and um, the center section, the first few rows have been set aside for the prosecution's uh, witnesses and, and um, law enforcement and um, the people who are assisting the prosecution as they are going through their case. Then on either side, behind that are the victims' families. So Kay and Larry sit behind uh, the prosecution staff, um, along with any other of the um, family victim uh, uh, folks. And then on either side are the, the uh, gallery. So when you walk in the courtroom door, um, to your left is a bank of windows that looks out, out onto the parking lot. And to your right is the jury box. And directly in front is Judge Boyce. And to your right is the witness stand and a screen above the witness for projecting trial exhibits. The way that the courtroom is set up for this trial is that the prosecution is facing Judge Boyce, but the defense table is turned so that Chad Daybell is looking directly at the jury. The jury is along this wall and Daybell's desk is, is sitting right in front, so he is facing the jury. So that makes the prosecution and and Daybell be to be like an a, an L shape. So um, this is exactly the way it was for Lori's trial. The jury was able to observe uh, Lori throughout the trial, and the jury is able to observe Chad. Now I will say about the makeup of the jury. I think this jury is slightly different than Lori's jury. I think this jury appears from appearances. Now, all we know is what we learned in, in uh, jury selection and observing, looking at appearances. It appears that this group is a little bit more a little less emotional, if I can say. 
I mean, we had one juror in Lori's trial who, when they went through talking about Charles Ballow's death, we, we've gotten some of that, but probably not as much as we will. But there were jurors, one in particular, who just sat there with their arms folded and glared at Lori and just stared daggers at her. And I haven't seen that with this jury so far. Um, they seem a little bit more reserved. Um, and um, I have not seen, I know that it has been reported, but I have not seen the, this jury in tears. Now, we have not seen and have not gotten down to the really graphic um, autopsy photos. Um, one photo of Tammy Daybell was shown, which we, those of you who watched Lori's trial have seen before. It was a photograph of her body after her body was exhumed. She is wearing her temple clothing, and and um, uh, in general, women wear a veil uh, in their temple clothing, and um, that is pulled back. You can see her face, and um, uh, I mean, it, it definitely is an autopsy photo. But to be honest, she looks pretty peaceful. Um, we have not seen a lot of the, um, the, the really graphic photos yet. Uh, there were a couple of photos that were not shown to the gallery and were shown only to the, um, uh, to the jury. But what I'll say is I have not seen the sort of reaction that, I have, that we saw in Lori's trial. So um, I, I think they are different. Uh, I am uh, sending a quick text. So hold on here, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, we haven't seen that same level of emotion, I think, in, with this jury as we saw in Lori's jury. So, um, I think that's a little interesting. The ages of the jury, I would say mostly 40-ish, uh, a couple a little older, one or two maybe late 20s, um, uh, 10 women and eight men. Uh, no, sorry, that's reverse. Uh, 10 men and eight women. Uh, and um, they seem like a pretty fair cross section. Um, they all have notebooks and they all seem to be taking um, notes, some more than others, but they all seem to be making some notes. Um, there's one woman uh, closest to the gallery who is a real avid note taker. She, she's, um, if I had to guess, uh, 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 I suspect she might be a teacher. She she takes very, uh, you can tell, she's taking copious notes. Um, Chad appears, he, he has a, a laptop in front of him, and it appears that he is assisting John Pryor in keeping track of exhibits, which is probably a smart move. John Pryor doesn't have help doing that, and it does give Chad something to do during the trial so he looks engaged. And, you know, it is a smart tactic to keep your client engaged in, in what's going on. So I think it's a win-win on both sides. But it, from um, the time that I was sitting behind them and could sort of see what he was doing, he appeared to be scrolling through a, a, an exhibit list. And um, so that makes some sense to keep him busy and engaged. And it's a win for John Pryor because he doesn't have anybody else to do that for him. Let's talk about John Pryor because John Pryor has elicited a lot of strong responses from people. We knew from the very beginning that this was not going to be the same kind of trial as we had from Lori Vallow. 
we knew we were going to get a vigorous defense, and that was not what happened in Lori's case. Now, I always have to preface this by saying, I know that what Lori did was told her lawyers, you cannot bring up these things. You can't throw Chad under the bus. You can't make Alex look bad. And you can't bring up my mental health. That really tied their hands. But even at that, their performance was pretty darn lackluster. So I we knew from the very beginning that we were going to get a full-throated and uh, more, much more vigorous defense um, than, uh, than Lori's case. And Pryor has, in that regard, John Pryor has not disappointed. He is one man um, up against four lawyers from the prosecution, and I think that he is doing a really good job. Now, I know y'all aren't going to want to hear that because you don't like him and you don't like Chad Daybell and you don't want to want Chad Daybell to, to get any sort of a break. But let's remember, this is how our system works. This is why our system works, because every defendant is entitled to a vigorous defense. And that means our system is protected by the fact that the government is put to the test, that we believe that the government needs to put their best case on, and we need to put that evidence to the test. So John Pryor is doing a good job. He is doing exactly what a defense lawyer should do. Now, John Pryor is, has a big personality, and it comes across in court as big. People point that out to me, and I think, okay, but I practiced law for nearly 30 years, and believe me, John Pryor is not the worst by a, a long stretch. He reminds me of every man of that era of who... who who practiced, who took the bar and, and began practicing in the 80s time frame, maybe late 70s, every one of them. Um, yeah, he's a little bit misogynistic. He's a little bit uh, bombastic, um, but he is doing a good job for his client. He is doing what he is supposed to do. So I can't fault him for that. Are there times that I roll my eyes and think, oh, John, is it the way I would do it? Absolutely, I would do things differently. But I have always said, I'm not the right lawyer for everybody. And I may not, may not have been the right lawyer for Chad Daybell. Um, so everybody is entitled to a defense. I think John Pryor is doing a good job. And what's most important in my mind is Chad Daybell has confidence in him. Chad Daybell knows John Pryor and has confidence in him. And that's hugely important in a case. So now let's talk about really what happened during the trial. So I'm just going to run through quickly through each one of the witnesses because they were all law enforcement witnesses so far. Um, all, some of them pretty technical. So let's start out with Ray Hermosillo. At the time that he was um, involved in the case, when the case first started, he was a detective. He is now a lieutenant um, and probably very deservedly so. He is a lieutenant with the Rexburg Police Department and he has been the lead investigator on the case. Um, we saw him for the first time on the stand in Chad's preliminary hearing. We also saw him on the stand in Lori's trial. He's very well-spoken. He's very, of course, very conversant in this case and uh, very um, knowledgeable about the facts. I mean, he has a great grasp of the overview of the case. And um, it, it was very smart on the prosecution's part to lead off with him both times. 
It also was the prosecution's way of getting out the information about how the children, how and where the children were found. So that was the really the jury's introduction to the case. It's an overview of the case and then a discussion of um, a discussion of how the uh, the the condition uh, of the body recovery and a, and a real overview of how it happened, who did what, um, what was found, all of those uh, all of those things. The next person was Vince Kayakamanu. Um, he is uh, Pacific a uh, Pacific Islander name. I don't know whether it is uh, Hawaiian, Samoan, but uh, definitely Pacific Islander. Um, he he has a sibling. She was called in. His sister was called in Lori Vallow's case because she was a nine one one operator. Uh, uh, that I think she took the 911 call when Tammy Daybell, uh, in one of the times that, that police were, uh, 911 was called up for Tammy Daybell. The first one was when um, Alex Cox took shot at her, and then the second one was um, the morning she died. I don't remember which of those incidents um, uh, Vince Kayakamanu's sister took the call, but um, she was a witness in Lori Ballow's case. Um, he is now the Madison County Chief Deputy. Uh, at that point, at the point that he was involved in the case, he was a deputy for Fremont County, but he has moved over to Madison County to become the Chief Deputy, and he's in charge of the Madison County Jail. So he was there to um, introduce the jail call from Lori Ballard to Chad Daybell on the morning that the children were found. He also said that he interviewed Zulema Pastenas three to four times and was there when they advised Garth uh, about, he's interviewed Garth twice. Once they went and got him, took him to the police station and he was interviewed there with his lawyer. And then they went to the school and met with him to advise him of the results of Tammy's autopsy. Um, and that was about all that he testified to that was significant. And the next person we had was Detective Eric Wheeler. Now, his testimony was lengthy, and the reason for that was he was one of the officers that was assigned, uh, one of the uniformed officers that was assigned to do traffic control and to cordon off the Daybell property on the morning of June 9th when the search warrant was served for the children. And he was the officer who was tasked to go after Chad when Chad left. Now, here was something I wasn't clear on until this, uh, until Detective Wheeler uh, testified. Um, Chad was, when they, when um, Ray Hermosillo served the search warrant on Chad, he was still asleep. They went upstairs to his bedroom. They woke him up, they let him get dressed. He went downstairs, he looked over the warrant, he called Mark Means, and they told Chad, you can remain on the property, but you have to have an escort. Um, you have to be accompanied by police. So at that point, Mark went, Mark, his son, who answered the door, went to um, Emma's. Emma lived kitty corner, kind of across the street and, and opposite Chad and Tammy in a rental house across the street. And so she, uh, Mark went to, to um, Emma's house and 
Chad went out and sat in his car in the driveway. His car was backed into the driveway. So he, we had to look over his shoulder to see what was going on in the, in the backyard. But he sat there and made a few phone calls. He later, um, and there was an officer out there observing him the whole time. And um, so there was a police officer who had eyes on Chad at all, at all times. He then drove his car over to Emma's house and went inside Emma's house and was there for about an hour and a half before he came out of Emma's house, got in his car and drove away. Now, some reports already sped away, some say he didn't. However, um, he claims that he was going into town to meet with an attorney. I don't, I don't know who, because John Pryor is based out of, uh, out of the Boise area. Here's the interesting thing. Um, Detective Wheeler was um, somebody on the radio about the same time, within less than the minute of the time when the announcement came across the radio, we have bodies. We have human remains. Chad jumped in his car and sped away. And Detective Wheeler was told, go after him. So he did. Now, he, Chad didn't get very far. And um, he was taken into custody. And he, he was handcuffed and placed in the back of Detective Wheeler's car. Detective Wheeler, so Chad left from Emma's, which I didn't know. And the other thing I didn't know was where he was stopped. He could still see what was going on in his backyard. So he was still observing the operation going on in his backyard at the time that he was sitting in Detective Wheeler's uh, police car. The other thing that happened was Emma apparently could see from her house that he'd been pulled over. She then drove up in and um, was present when Chad was arrested and put in the back of Detective Wheeler's uh, squad car. Now, Detective Wheeler's squad car is equipped with a camera that recorded the the uh, all of the interactions between Chad and law enforcement while he was sitting in the back of the police car. There is a dash cam that looks out and and looks out at the front of the car, but there is a, a camera that faces the back of the car and that records anything that happens in uh, with a suspect. And the police all are wearing body cams. So, um, <clears throat> The officer took Chad, put him in the back of the car, and um, but then permitted Emma to go and talk to him. So they open the back door, and Emma then leans down, and she and Chad have a conversation that lasts quite a while, maybe 15, 20 minutes. And there are some telling things that happen. Chad is concerned about... Um, making sure that she takes care of his financial stuff that pays his bills and whatever. He gives her his wallet. He, um, he gives her sort of a rundown on where money is so that she can take care of things. But there were a few things that stood out. Um, they, they talked about finances. Um, he he goes through and tells her what cards are what, if there's money in accounts that there are debit cards for. Um, he tells her that to go in Mark's room and that in the drawer in Mark's room, he will find two white envelopes that have $9,000 total in them. And, um, and, and th that cash is there. He apologizes and tells her he's sorry. Um, and um, Emma says that she's been texting with John Pryor earlier. And, and then Chad said, he, she asks about whether or not he's going to be released. And Chad says to her, no, I'm not coming home. 
he says that twice. The first, the first one is a little more vague. The second one is very concrete. He suggests that Emma should move into the Daybell house. And Emma said the spirit told her she would be moving. Um, she, she then says she can tell her landlord that she's moving across the street and she moves in with uh, Mark and Seth, who apparently were both living there. It's a little confusing as to who was actually living in the Daybell house. We know that Garth was there the day that Tammy Daybell was uh, died. That was in October of 2019. By June of 2020, it appears when Tammy died, Mark was gone on a mission. He was in South Africa. And so they, um, and he actually didn't get home even in time for Tammy's funeral. So, but at the time that uh, in June, when the bodies were found, it, uh, from what I can tell, Mark and Seth were living at home. So Emma then assures her dad that she will take care of all of the money business and that she will take care of, of the young, her younger siblings. So she did, she and her husband, Joseph, moved into the Daybell home. She makes a very interesting comment. Um, now, mind you, Chad Daybell has just handed her his wallet and told her where there's $9,000 in cash. However, she says, um, you raised us to be independent although I think there's a good argument that Tammy raised them to be independent. She says, you raised us to be independent with your wallet. We're not Colby. So it's very clear from that, that, that Chad Daybell had been venting to his children about the fact that Lori was constantly sending Colby money. So, um, Emma also commented that Chad looked surprised when, uh, when he heard that human remains had been found on his property. I, I'm not sure I agree with that, but she made a point of saying, we were surprised and you look surprised. But Chad sped off within moments of hearing that the bodies had been found, which seems pretty telling of consciousness of guilt. Um, John Pryor claims that Chad uh, didn't know at the time that the remains were found, but he was watching from Emma's house before he left. And just before he sped off, it was clear that JJ's body had just been found. Um, while he was in the police car, he uh, could see the work that was continuing and um, And the other thing that was really interesting is he gives her, he pulls out of his wallet and gives her a card that has all the tellmate in information on it for Lori, because he tells Emma she needs to continue to put money on Lori's books. In the, and, and Emma says to him, I already have an account because I've already been talking to Lori, which I thought was very interesting. It seems that of everybody, of all of his kids, Emma seems to have aligned a bit with Lori, which I find a little surprising considering the circumstances. Um, and Chad Daybell once again uh, tells Emma, I'm, I won't be coming home. And the second time he's very, he's very matter of fact and decisive about it. I, I, I'm not, I won't be coming home. So that finished up with, with Deputy Wheeler, and the next person we had was Lieutenant Joe Powell. Now, I heard all kinds of comments about Lieutenant Powell, and I had the same impression when I heard him during Lori's trial. He, is, he has the worst grammar in the world. He says, uh, you know, it ain't and, and done, uh, uh, done, Gun did, and uh, she don't go to the doctor often. Was was one thing he said. He's not dumb. 
Um, he sounds like it. He does not. He does not come across well on the stand. He is uh, kind of talks slow. Um, he doesn't have a southern accent, but he definitely has a lot of those sort of mannerisms and sort of affectations. And so, um, he he's not dumb, but he sounds like it. He did the search warrant for the exhumation of Tammy's body and oversaw the exhumation and the autopsy in Utah. So he traveled to Utah to, to do that. Um, he also said, uh, Chad said, uh, oh, he also got Tammy's medical records and looked at her medical records and, um, and reported that Tammy's family said she don't go to the doctor often. Now, John Pryor, this was the first time we saw John Pryor get pretty assertive. And he, he really went after Powell. I think part of it is because he comes across as not the brightest bulb. Um, and he, I think that John Pryor at least thought that he could get the better of him. He didn't get the better of him. Um, uh, Lieutenant Powell really, I mean, he is a lieutenant, uh, you know, he's got to have something on the ball. And he definitely um, was able to hold his own with John Pryor. But John Pryor really kind of went after him and kept asking him, you know, um, it was based on this little information that you dug Tammy Daybell out of the ground. You disturbed her grave. You, you know, oh, and he, he really, John Pryor really came across as if this were a real um, desecration of, of Tammy Daybell's grave. Um, the thing that John Pryor said was that Tammy Daybell was taking a lot of supplements, including a supplement for pain and bruising. And then Pryor pointed out that the medical examiner said Tammy had old bruises. That is not true. Um, the medical examiner, and you're all going to hear it when the medical examiner talks about Tammy's autopsy, the medical examiner said Tammy had bruises on her chest and her upper arms. They were um, bruises that were consistent with being held down. And they he uh, excised those bruises to determine whether they were new or not and believe that they happened right about the time of her death. Um, so uh, that was sort of a misrepresentation, I think. Um, the next person was Nicole Hill, uh, Heideman. And um, now I'm, I'm going day to day. I'm going over all the days. I'm not sort of breaking it up by, by which day they appeared. So the next one was Nicole Heideman. She is an FBI tactical specialist, and she investigated all the telephones. Um, they found that Chad Daybell had nine phone numbers, three of which were of interest and in that they um, did complete extractions on. Lori Vallow had six, Alex had six, and once again, there were three phones that they focused on for each, each for Lori and Alex. So um, John Pryor made a good point here, which I thought was kind of interesting. On cross-examination, he asked her whether, um, he, he pointed out that the day, that the night that JJ is thought to have been killed, um, Melanie Gibb and um, David Warwick were visiting with Lori and were actually staying in her townhouse. And um, he points out, he, he talked about whether or not uh, he, he goes goes through the fact that they were there that night with Lori. They were doing a podcast. Alex took um, JJ out because he was being kind of disruptive while they were trying to do their podcast. Brought JJ back in later, apparently asleep on his shoulder, and took him upstairs. So John Pryor asked... Well, if Melanie Gibb and David Warwick were there that night, did you did you download and extract their phones? I thought that was an excellent question. They were there that night. 
Um, David Warwick reported that he'd had a nightmare and that Melanie Gibb woke him up from this nightmare and they they wanted they they Melanie went and knocked on Lori's door and the door was locked and she was trying to get Lori's attention to get Lori to call Chad and get Chad to give David a blessing because he'd had this horrendous, um, very graphic, vivid nightmare. Um, so I thought that was super interesting and a really good point um, for John Pryor to point out that, in fact, they didn't ex they didn't. Uh, extract uh, Melanie and David Warwick's phones, Melanie Gibb and David Warwick's phones. So um, the next witness was Detective Duncan. Now, Detective Duncan was on for a while because he is from Chandler Police Department, and he started explaining about Charles Vallow's death. So went into um, the circumstances around Ch uh, Charles Vallow's death, the extraction from uh, Charles's phone, Lori Vallow's email uh, about Chad about the the email she sent to Chad, making it look like it was from Charles Vallow, saying that Charles Vallow wanted to write a book and wanted Chad's help. It was a it was a, a ruse to give so that uh, Chad could show Tammy a reason why he needed to go to Arizona. So it was, it was a ruse. Um, an interesting thing that I don't think we knew before was that there were texts from Lori Vallow to Chad Daybell the morning that Charles Vallow was murdered. Um, there was a text at 6, 12 a.m. There was another text at 7.01, and there was a final text at 7.33. Now, Charles Vallow uh, arrived at Lori's house somewhere right around 7.30. So uh, the next person on the stand was Mark Sari. He is a special agent um, in uh, the Social Security Administration. He's an investigator for Social Security. So he he was called uh, to talk about Social Security benefits when they started, when they ended, uh, to address the period where the children were already dead and Lori didn't notify Social Security and continued to um, draw their benefits. So the one interesting thing was, prior to trial starting, the judge had ruled in some preliminary evidentiary rulings that anything having to do with Joseph Ryan's death, that's Tylee's biological father, Annie Cushing's brother, um, Lori's third husband, Joseph Ryan, the judge ruled that anything having to do with with the circumstances around his death were too remote and not relevant to Chad Daybell's trial. But interestingly enough, um, it has come up as the discussions have happened about the fact that Tylee was receiving social security benefits for being a minor child of a deceased parent. So it's come out a couple of different times no, no detail has been offered, but it, it, it. I think there's an argument. The door's been opened there, even though the judge has said it's not really relevant. Today, um, now I want to talk a little bit um, about a, a motion hearing that happened yesterday. So I'm going to talk about that. It happened um, at about well after lunch uh, yesterday. I'm gonna talk about that, but I wanna get through all the witnesses. So the last witness that brings us up to date that was on the stand when they adjourned today is Detective Chuck Concitus. He is Rexburg Police Department detective. He has been involved in getting all of the different records and um, so he had he he had a lot to talk about. So he got um, 
the day that the children's bodies were found, he wasn't originally on the search, but he went to see if he could help. Oh, no, I, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. It, it was the day the warrant was served on Lori, uh, Lori, all the apartments. So he came in and asked if there was anything he could do to help because they were they served warrants on Lori's apartment, Alex's apartment, and Melanie Boudreaux Pulaski's apartment. So he was there and said, can I help? And they said, sure, you know, get, make a sweep and see if there's anything else of evidentiary value. He's the one who found the rental contract for the storage unit on the printer in Lori's bedroom. So he got a warrant to search that storage unit. They, he also found out that there was a post office box. L Lori had rented a post office box in Sugar City. Now, Sugar City is just this little kind of white spot in the road between Rexburg and St. Anthony, where Fremont County Courthouse is. So it's, it's probably 15 minutes away from downtown Rexburg. Um, St. Anthony's probably 20, 25 minutes away from downtown Rexburg. Um, so they're all, they're all surrounding communities. So um, Lori got a PO box in Sugar City. Why there, I don't know. Maybe it was close to Chad's or maybe it was the only place you could get one. I don't know, but anyway. So he discovered that she had a P.O. box in Sugar City and got a warrant for the post office box. When he, when he got the warrant, he discovered that there, were, there, there was stuff. There were about 100 uh, letters in that post office box. And among all of those letters, there were letters to, for Alex. There, were, there was stuff for Lori. And, and there was stuff that was directed at Charles Vallow. So... He went through it all and discovered there were a bunch of financial statements. So he wrote warrants for all of the financial uh, institutions that that where all those all that mail had come from. And he went through all of the accounts and got the records of all of the accounts. Now, at one at, at one at some point, all those records were turned over to the FBI for analysis. So he didn't necessarily do all the analysis, but he looked at all the records for Tylee, for Lori, for Chad, for Alex, for Chad and Tammy, um, and uh, some that were still remaining for Charles Vallow. So he did a lot of, of following up on all that paperwork. He once again mentioned Joe Ryan because he mentioned that Tylee was getting Social Security benefits because her father was deceased. And I, it was very interesting. He's a very nice man and, uh, and, and kind of soft-spoken and at one point uh, choked up when he was talking about the kids' bodies being recovered. Um, there were some interesting little revelations uh, that came out of it. Um, one I thought was interesting was in March of 2019, now to place this in, in its chronology, in um, late February is when Lori separated from Charles. This is the incident where she went and got his truck from the airport and hid it and got rid of all his clothes and he had to break into his house. This is the incident where you see him on the sidewalk talking to a police officer. There's a body cam video of him talking about she's lost her mind. She thinks I'm a, I, I'm Ned Schneider. Uh, she, she thinks she can kill me with her powers. And the police help him to break into his own house. Lori and the children are not there. They are, are staying in a hotel. So shortly after that, Lori leaves JJ with Charles and disappears. And she is gone for 59 days. Now, we've been able to reconstruct some of that time. She goes to Hawaii. She takes Tylee with her. Tylee comes back because she's working for Summer Shiflet's husband. Uh, in their chiropractic office as office help. 
and um, and she stays with Alex Cox while she's she's there. Um, but Lori's gone for 59 days. And after 59 days of absolutely no contact, Charles reaches out to her, emails her, texts her, says, you know, JJ keeps asking where you are. And she suddenly appears in his uh, at his apartment in Houston to reconcile. She tells Melanie Gibb, uh, I just went to get his finances in order. Now that is March of uh, of 20, well, April of, of 2019. But interestingly enough, um, D Detective Consitus finds um, that Lori in March, on March 14th of 2019, paid for Chad Daybell um, to fly from Idaho Falls, which is the closest airport to Rexburg, um, to Mesa. Uh, Mesa, Arizona is a suburban airport, kind of like Burbank outside of LA. Uh, it's a suburban airport, smaller and um, easier to get in and out of. And a lot of the uh, regional carriers fly in and out of there. So she paid for Chad to come and visit her in Mesa. Now, who knows what pretext they used for him uh, being away from home because Tammy was still alive. So was Charles Vallow. Both spouses were still alive, but this is during the time when Lori went missing and uh, Charles was in the process of moving he and JJ to, uh, to Houston. <laughs> and he had filed, Charles had filed for divorce. Um, the the last thing that came up that was of interest now um john Cryer is still is is really just beginning his cross examination on detective concitus so uh, i'm i'm sure there'll be more to talk about um after court tomorrow and friday but one thing that concitus pointed out was in his investigation of alex cox's um finances Alex Cox was working for a company, a porta potty company. So he was the guy who went around and picked up and delivered porta potties and went to places and pumped them out. Not a pleasant job, but he made pretty good money, and um, and and he had been at that job for a while, a year and a half, two years. He quit that job when he moved with Lori down to. Um, down to Rexburg. Just before he quit that job, he went to a loan company and took out a personal loan for $21,000, which I'm sure was the max he could get. And so he, over um, a period of, uh, so they, they moved to Rexburg and Lori and Alex, their apartment move-ins were uh, August 1st, right around August 1st of 2019. And from August 10th of 2019 until October 24th of 2019, which is right after Tammy Daybell died, she died on October 19th, he made 46 firearm-related purchases. So we know that the morning that time Tammy Daybell was shot at, he went to Idaho Falls, which is about a half an hour drive from Rexburg, uh, to the sportsman's warehouse there and bought black rain pants, black rain jacket, black ski mask, black gloves, um, in anticipation of taking a shot at Tammy Daybell. That was on October 9th. And then Tammy Daybell died on October 19th. So between August 10th, which would have been within a few days of moving to Rexburg, and October 24th, which were was a few days after Tammy Daybell's death, he made 46 firearm related purchases. Now they weren't all guns. Some of them were were equipment and and bullets and 
other sort of related uh, gun paraphernalia. We also know that he went to two different firing ranges and and practiced firing that gun and sighting it in. So I thought that was of interest. Um, I'm sure that we will hear more about Alex Cox and his gun escapades. I'm sure that we will see the photographs that were on Lori's iCloud account of pictures of, in a store of bullets and those sorts of things. I mean, we are just barely scratching the surface on an eight week trial. So we are gonna hear a lot more detail. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is the fact that at Lori's trial, we did not hear a lot about Chad's phone extractions. We heard plenty about the text messages back and forth. We heard about the loin fire saga and all of that. What we didn't hear was a lot about Chad Daybell's location on in certain uh, on certain days. Little bit, not a lot. So I think we're going to hear a lot more about um, Chad's location data, um, and that is that's going to be really interesting. Um, so tomorrow they'll be going back to. Um, uh, Detective Concitus and uh, for cross examination. Um, John Pryor has definitely been vigorously cross examining and um, he has been vigorously making objections. And, um, you know, when the trial started out, I think everyone was a little anxious and a little bit um, on edge and nervous. Because we had both the prosecution and the defense kind of stepping over objections. Uh, the prosecution, Rob Wood, would object, and Pryor wouldn't give the judge time to rule on the objection before he revises question. Uh, Rob Wood was doing it too. They were kind of walking over one another. But I think that things have settled down a little bit and they've gotten into more of a, of a rhythm because a trial really is, kind of has a rhythm to it. And so um, I will say John Pryor is in my estimation doing a very workmanlike job. I mean, he is doing a very efficient and, and um, prepared job. And he's got a tough road because he's doing it alone. He doesn't have somebody in the background keeping track of stuff for him. He doesn't have somebody in the background who's able to leaf through a, 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 a trial exhibit and find exactly the, the phrase he wants. So I have to say he's very fluent in the facts of the case and very fluent in the trial exhibits and where things are and the questions he wants to ask. That is a function of some really intense preparation. So I've got to give him big kudos for that because I think he's worked very hard to, to be it where he is. It is a marathon. Um, I think I've told you the longest case I've ever tried was two weeks and I was whooped. It took me two weeks to recover. So it is, it is exhausting because you are on for eight hours or seven hours, whatever it is that you're in court. The minute the, the bailiff says, all rise, your total focus and attention is right here. And you cannot let your mind wander for a minute. You cannot even... You can't be distracted for even a minute because something's going to happen. You're going to miss it. And you've got to be thinking a step ahead of where the prosecutor's going. So the prosecutor's asking this question. You've got to be thinking, okay, what's the prosecutor trying to get out of that? Okay. And where do I want to go? Uh, how do I respond? Where do, where do I want to go? What question do I want to to, to uh ask in order to shift direction a little bit. So it is exhausting because you have to be on all the time. 
Now, when court gets out, you've still got to get ready for tomorrow, which means you get out of court at 3.30. The judge has, has, has said he ends court at 3.30. The reason for that is so that he can take up motions afterwards, so that there's, because in most courtrooms, you cannot keep court staff past five o'clock. Um, the trial court administrator frowns on having to pay overtime for court staff. So it, you can't keep them past five o'clock. So the judge has allowed that window of, um, of time uh, in order to um, ha have a little bit of a buffer. So next thing I want to talk about um, is I, I want to talk about, I'm just checking my text to make sure I don't have any any messages coming in that I need to address um, from our moderator. So, uh, the, but the last thing I want to talk about is the motion that we heard yesterday. There are several motions that were sort of hanging out there. Some of them were just starting to get little glimpses into some of the stuff that has been previously sealed. So one of the things that happened was the week before the trial started, so before jury selection started, John Pryor had subpoenaed Rob Wood. Now, there are a couple of reasons why um, this, this may have happened. Um, so I'm, I'm going to toss out there as much as I know, okay? Two reasons. One, John Pryor has always felt that um, that the prosecution did more witness preparation than is really appropriate, okay? Now, it is perfectly acceptable for a prosecutor to sit down with a witness and go over their testimony, to, to um, go over the police reports that have to do with their testimony, to talk about their statements, if the statements are recorded, to have them listen to their statements, but it is never okay for the prosecutor to tell a witness how to testify. I want you to say X, Y, Z. So John Pryor has always felt, um, whether this is true or not, I don't know because I have not seen all the discovery, none of us have, but John Pryor has always felt that the prosecution overstepped their, um, what is proper and ethical and moved into the realm of um, witness coaching. So John Pryor has always been uh, wanted to be able to bring that out. The other thing is that we know that there was an, a period of time when this case very first started, when the children were missing and Lori uh, was brought back from Hawaii. There, were, there was in Madison County, a county Facebook group for county employees. And we know that some of the people who were involved in this case, county employees that were involved in this case, potentially prosecutors, court staff, judges were active in this Facebook group for county employees, law enforcement, and that we have heard. Now, we've seen a few things. Uh, I've seen a few screenshots of things, but I don't have all the information. And I want to make this clear. I don't have all the information. That, in part, was the reason why I filed to have, uh, have stuff unsealed years ago in this case, because of these allegations. But apparently, there were people who are, were and are still involved in this case that were commenting on the evidence prior to um, the charges. And that is a very serious misstep. That is why early in the case, both John Pryor and Mark Means attempted to have Rob Wood disqualified and the judge didn't allow it. 
So we don't know why John Pryor subpoenaed Rob Wood, whether it was because of those Facebook messages or whether it was because of the contact with potential witnesses. Nonetheless, they had a, a closed evidentiary hearing in advance of the trial starting and the judge quashed the subpoena and said, no, you can't subpoena Rob Wood. So John Pryor <clears throat> in his exhibits filed uh, one of his proposed exhibits, exhibit 113, was a proposal or was an exhibit that was a list of many, many, like hundreds of text messages between Melanie Gibb and Rob Wood. And that triggered the prosecution to get all, all up and sweaty and file a motion to limit prior from using that exhibit or calling uh, Rob Wood as a witness. So there was a hearing yesterday at, uh, when uh, everybody got back from lunch, but before the jury came in, the judge had a hearing on the issue and the two sides argued their positions. Now, as it turned out, John Pryor said, I have no intention of subpoenaing Rob Wood. I want to use these as impeachment. I want to be able to impeach Melanie Gibb with these text messages that she's been exchanging with the prosecution. And I want to show her bias. I want to show she's in the tank for the prosecution. And the judge allowed it. He denied the prosecution's motion to, um, to uh, exclude that exhibit and uh, granted their motion to, um, uh, and denied their motion and said, I'm gonna take John Pryor at his word that he isn't having the intention of calling Rob Wood as a, as a witness. So that was that hearing. However, on Thursday, tomorrow, uh, after court is over, there is a juicier hearing. Um, I'm gonna take a minute and I'm gonna share my screen and then we're gonna, as soon as I'm done talking about this motion, we're gonna take questions. So if you haven't gotten your questions posted in the chat, please do. And uh, I know that I see that Jen has been, uh, has been starring them in the chat. Hang on, I gotta get all up in your grill here so I can find the, the, uh, The document I'm looking for, and I got to get up all close so I can uh, so I can find it. Okay, so before the trial started, this little doozy came out. Here is all we know about this. Okay, on March 29th, so this is before trial started, at 11 o'clock, 11 p.m., so just before midnight. A non-party presented for filing its, and you got to check this out because there's all these typos in it, motion to intervene and continue the trial in these proceedings. So there are typos in the words motion, continue, and proceedings. Counsel for the state and counsel for the defendant alerted the court after they received the notification of service through the court's electronic filing system. So what happens is when you file something, the you, you also create a, a proof that you have served the uh, all of the parties in the case. And so the the proof of service showed up and they thought, oh hold on. So then they started looking. Um, both state and defense have raised concerns about the impropriety of this attempt to intervene procedurally and substantively. Additionally, both the state and the defense have requested the court immediately seal the document or alternatively strike it from the case. 
the court has reviewed the pleading pursuant to Idaho Court Administrative Rule 32I2E. Upon the request of the parties, the court will temporarily seal the motion pending further review until such time as the court can call a hearing uh, to determine the substance of the motion. So the only thing we know about, because the judge sealed the actual motion, the only thing we know about it is, if you see my pointer here, this guy was served with a copy of the judge's order to seal the document. So this is Terry Ratliff. Terry Ratliff is the head of the public defender in Mountain Home, Idaho, which is a community of just a little bit east of Boise. So we do not know who this guy is. He is in no way related to this case, but he is a public defender and he is death penalty qualified. So we don't really know at this point why this guy is trying to intervene. Now, let me talk just really briefly about intervention because you gotta sort of understand how, you gotta know in order to figure out how weird this is. When a person intervenes in a case, and it's done much more often in a civil case than in a criminal case, but what it means is, judge, I wanna be added to the lawsuit. Or a party to the lawsuit says, judge, you have failed to join a necessary party. So that party needs to be joined into the case. So either way, we've got people who are trying to get into the suit, okay? Now this guy, so if this person were trying to join on the defense team, this is not the way he would do it. He would reach out to John Pryor and he would ask to come alongside and be co-counsel. And that would be done by a notice to the court that he was being added to the defense team. It would not in no way be a motion to intervene. So no one can quite figure out why this death penalty qualified attorney, very experienced award-winning attorney, is filing a motion to intervene and continue the trial uh, in Chad Daybell's case. He apparently has no relation to the case. So, I'm back, popped back. So he has no relation to the case. So we don't know why he is has filed this motion. But, um, we, they're going to have a hearing at 3.30 tomorrow to, to find this out. Um, as far as I know, the notice on the hearing does not say that this is a sealed hearing. So I'm going to stick around at 3.30 and find out what's going on. If it appears that there's something significant, maybe we'll do a quick surprise live. But I don't think it's, I think it's a nothing burger, frankly. So we'll, we'll wait to find out what this motion is all about. Um, we are going to continue to see motions in limine and motion limiting uh, evidentiary motions going forward. We're going to continue to see the court having to do these brief motion hearings uh, throughout this trial. That is very typical, particularly in death penalty cases, because every time the judge makes a ruling, every time the judge says, overruled, sustained, yes, that evidence comes in, no, that evidence doesn't come in, that is a ruling that could be appealed once the appellate, uh, once the, if the appeal gets taken. I mean, that presumes he's found guilty and there's an appeal. So the point being that it is critically important because if you don't preserve an error at the trial level, you cannot raise it upstream. You cannot go back to the appellate court and say, judge, uh, uh, this big mistake happened in the trial because they're gonna say, if you didn't raise it and make your record at the trial level, it doesn't get appealed. 
So that is why John Pryor, that is why death penalty attorneys in general are absolutely scrupulous, methodical about making sure that they have preserved every possible objection because you can't appeal it if you didn't preserve it. So that's why you're going to continue to see John Pryor making many, many objections and, and that you're going to see a lot of these small evidentiary hearings that rulings that have to be held outside the presence of the jury or limiting instructions, evidentiary rulings, because um, they're trying really hard to get it right. So, so that was a lot to get through. So let's take some of your questions. I'm gonna grab a sip of water here. And let's see what you have. Uh, it's a two-story house, so I don't know what that question's about. <laughs> um, Great Laker, if you could be a little bit more um, explanatory that would help um, because I don't know what that means so please uh, repost your question with a little bit more oh Chad's house Chad's house oh thanks Jen Chad's house is is a one-story house that had an addition put on it and that addition has a loft and upstairs, I believe there were two bedrooms in that kind of loft area. Um, the master and uh, the room that Garth was staying in. So Chad Daybell's house is for the most part single story, but there is one, uh, one like addition uh, part of the house that's a single story with a loft. Um, I don't think it's two story all the across the whole width of that addition. I think it's um, the way that the police described it when uh, Hermosillo described it when he went up the stairs at the top of the stairs there was a half wall and and Chad and Tammy's bedroom was on the other side of that half wall. So that's about as much as I know about the interior layout. Good question though. Axel, the car guy, do you think John Pryor is being so aggressive to draw attention to himself for fame? No, I, I really don't. I think that John, this is John Pryor's personality. Um, I think that he is a much more aggressive, he has a much more aggressive style. Um, uh, Jim Archibald was much more the sort of, let me see if I can sort of explain this. Lawyers who uh, came up 30 years ago, 40 years ago, fall into a couple of categories that are sort of, and especially public defenders, okay? Um, they were either hippies or yuppies, and that was sort of where they came from. So you see somebody like Jim Archibald, he's got that sort of cool, laid back sort of, you know, he's definitely more on the hippie side. John Pryor, definitely more on the yuppie side. Definitely more on the had a sports car, had a fancy watch. Uh, definitely much more on the yuppie end set things. And that really sort of still reflects in people 40 years later. So I, I mean, these, are the, these were the kinds of folks who were getting into the law back then. They were people who were uh, had a passion and a mission and, and they're kind of, you know, a little anti-government. And, and then you had the, the yuppie guys who were in it to be rock stars. And, uh, and, and so, I mean, if you look at them, that's kind of where they are now. And um, I think, I think that is just John Pryor's personality. I absolutely do not think that he is putting anything on. Thank you, Polly Yo. Very sweet of you. Very kind. Thank you. Um, I, I'm 
I uh, just recently had to download some new software so that we can start doing those little weekend things we're going to do as soon as I get the new software figured out. Um, so thank you. That helps um, defray a little bit of that cost. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I think I think what you see is what you get with John Pryor. I don't think he's trying to get uh, to to bring fame to himself. Um, I think at at one point he was a little uh, he he was a little. Uh, Oh gosh, I I think at one point he was gave out a little too much information to the jury. There were times it was like, yeah, I didn't need to know that. But hey, Great Laker, uh, how old is each of the Daybell kids? You know, I would have to look that up. I don't have that information right off the top of my head. Um, they, I think the oldest uh, Garth is the oldest, and I think he's early thirties. And Mark is the youngest, and he must be maybe like 20 or 5. He, uh, he was on his mission when Tammy died. Uh, and you, don't, you go on a mission at 19, 18, 19 I think. So, um, <clears throat> so he came home from his mission, I think, a little bit early because of Tammy's death. And um, so that would put him... 24, 25. Um, uh, but I, I'll look it up and and uh, I'll I'll give you some exact numbers. Um, Daybell, making a note, kids, ages. I got gotcha. you. Um, they're all adults. Emma is married. Garth is married. Got married after Tammy died, I believe. Um, and I, I think Seth is also married, but I'm not positive. Um, so there are five of them. And um, I think what saved them was they were all adults and uh, they weren't in the way. So good question. Emma has at least one child, if not two. Hi, Jan Garner. Question, good boy. I'm concerned that Chad is going to get off on his charges. What are your thoughts? I don't think so. I think they have a pretty good case against Chad. Um, it's, it's certainly a circumstantial case, but it was a circumstantial case against Lori as well. So I, I don't see it. Um, I think that there is a lot of good in a circumstantial case circumstantial evidence is just as good as direct evidence um but a circumstantial case takes a little more work on the part of the prosecution because in a circumstantial case what you have to do is you have to take each one it's like a chain so you have to take each one of those discrete facts and link it up to the next one all the way down the chain and if there are too many breaks in the chain, that's when the jury's going to say, hmm, reasonable doubt. Now, I have not heard anything so far where I could say, ooh, that's going to raise reasonable doubt. I, am, I think the prosecution's pretty confident in their case. And I would be quite surprised if the jury came back and found Chad not guilty. Um, now, could they found him not guilty on some of the charges? That's possible. But I think a conspiracy charge is probably the easiest for the prosecution to prove because of all the text messages and all of the, you know, it may not be possible for them to place him exactly at the murder scene. Of course, we don't even really know where the murder scene is. We, we think it was Alex Cox's apartment, but it was pretty clean. They weren't able to find a lot in the way of evidence in that apartment. So who knows? Um, the only person who probably really knows are Chad and Lori, and they're not talking. So, um, you know, it may, it, the jury could say, I'm not sure we can place him exactly in this spot. 
but they certainly the, there's certainly ample information to link him to the conspiracy part of it. And all it takes is for him to be part of a conspiracy where two or more people agree to do something and one member of the conspiracy doesn't have to be Chad makes a makes a step toward um, completing the conspiracy, completing the crime they're conspiring. So the prosecution can argue Alex Cox took that step. He's the one who shot at Tammy Daybell. He's the one who shot at Brandon Boudreaux. There's this scheme, this common scheme, this plan. He's the guy. Um, and he took the substantial step, but Lori and Chad conspired with him. And that makes them equally as guilty. So I, I, I think they've got a pretty decent case. Um, and I think there's more in terms than we saw at Lori's trial in terms of um, Chad's electronic footprint. We haven't seen that yet. So uh, we have a long way to go. But I, I don't think Chad's going to get off on these charges. Um, I think he's going to be real sorry he didn't take a deal. So that's my humble opinion. Hi, Don Shackelford. Is it just me or does it seem like Pryor asks questions he doesn't know the answers to? I thought lawyers didn't do that. No, I think sometimes, sometimes lawyers will ask the next question, which they might not know the answer to but they're armed with the rest of the facts in the case. So sometimes we do ask the question we don't know the answer to, but only if we're armed with the facts of the case enough that we can deal with the answer. Um, the other thing I think Pryor does is he plays a little bit of Columbo. I'm confused. Can you explain to me? He may very well know the answer, but he's definitely going to couch it in terms of, asking a blind question. So it's a little bit of a tactic um, to say, I don't know, officer, I'm confused. Now, didn't you say, you know, he says things like, correct me if I'm wrong, or I might have this wrong, or, you know, and, and a lot of times that's, it's a little bit of a play. So good question. Oh man, I'm telling you what, it is spring, finally, in in Idaho. All the trees are blooming. Every one of these ornamental and fruit trees, I mean, they are like exploding. There are pink and white trees everywhere. And one thing I've learned about being in Idaho is in Idaho, in the springtime at least, the wind blows all the damn time. So what that means is people who have terrible allergies like me are snuffling and sniffing and sneezing constantly. Um, this is me medicated, and my my antihistamines are about ready to wear off. So uh, it's uh, it, spring here has been rough, and uh, so and everything is just so. Hi, TC. One of my my uh, instructors, my professors in my. Uh, creative Writing Master's Program went by TC. He's one of my favorite guys. Do you agree that Pryor is being misleading the jurors uh, the way he's acting in court? I find him very annoying. You know, um, I don't think he's being misleading. I think that's just who John Pryor is. I think he is a much more assertive lawyer than... than uh, Jim Archibald was when it comes to taking charge of a courtroom. Um, I, I mean, I think there are lawyers, and I I tend to be a little bit guilty of that. Um, when it's my turn to cross-examine a witness, I own the courtroom. And I think that uh, that John Pryor sort of feels that way too. And so I think that is just his style. I don't think that he's misleading the jurors by the way he's acting in court. I don't think that he is in any way doing anything except being a really assertive attorney for his client. And I realize that it could rub people the wrong way. 
I will tell you that I think sometimes lawyers who take that tactic, especially female lawyers, because female lawyers don't get away with as much um, uh, aggressiveness as male lawyers, I think sometimes that can turn the jury off. Um, I don't get the impression that he's turned him off, but I think he's kind of trying to walk that tightrope of being very um, forward and, and very uh, in charge of the courtroom when it's his turn uh, and still not putting people off. Um, so, uh, I mean, it's a, t it's a tough line to walk. Um, because jurors need to, jurors need to see the defense attorney as someone who knows what they're talking about, who's not being plowed over by the prosecution, who's not being, um, <clears throat> who, who's not, uh, giving in every time the prosecution makes an, uh, uh makes an objection, who's pushing back, who's. So they need to see that person as somebody who has authority, who knows what they're talking about, who's not cowed by the process. Um, and that's a fine line to walk, because if you go overboard, you can come across as surly and and hostile and and great on people's nerves. So um, I haven't seen him do what I would think is out of the realm of, of good lawyering. Um, and I haven't really seen him get to the point where he's sort of grating on the nerves of the jury. I don't get that impression from observing the jury. See, the one thing when y'all are watching um, the live stream, of course, is that you don't see the jury. One of the reasons I'm still going frequently is because I wanna see the reactions from the jury. Um, now, I'm not going to make it every day. It's the traffic getting into town is a pain in the rump. And uh, so I'm, I'm not going to be going in every day. But I will be going in every day this week, um, tomorrow and Friday. And then we'll see how things go on Monday. Um, I also just got an announcement that they're changing up how they're doing the, um, the admission into the courtroom. And it's going to be first come, first served. It's no longer... You no longer have to get on after the 22nd. You won't have to get on and get a ticket. I don't know how that's going to impact people getting into the courtroom, whether it's going to mean getting there at the crack of dawn to line up to get in. I, I don't know. Um, so we'll wait to see how those all those logistics play out. But it is interesting to sit in the courtroom. Um, it does give you a different perspective, and it certainly gives you an idea of the reactions of the of the jurors. And I have not gotten the impression at all that the jurors are put off by prior. So, which which is good for Chad, I think. Uh. <clears throat> oh, Arizona, please define argumentative as it applies to an objection. So the rules of evidence, um, sometimes objections are made that are not necessarily within the rules of evidence. Um, one, one that comes up all the time is asked and answered. There is no such objection as asked and answered. That is shorthand for, Your Honor, this evidence is cumulative. So, it, the argumentative is kind of the same. So you can't, you, you can't get, you can't as a defense attorney have a witness on the stand and get into an argument with them or make statements that are intended to inflame the witness, intended to get a, a, res a response, an angry response from the witness. So, it once again is kind of a fine line because you can say on cross-examination, isn't it true you did this? Isn't it true you did that? Doesn't this piece of evidence show that, that what you just said is wrong? 
doesn't it show that now you've changed your story? Were you lying then or are you lying now? Those are all questions that are fair game if you're if you are cross-examining a witness. But you can't pose your question in a way that is is meant to make your witness have have an, an angry response. So generally it's because the defense attorney's asked a question, the witness has answered, the defense attorney's kind of gone back for another poke, and um, the, the prosecution's going to stand up and say, this isn't really cross-examination, this is you arguing with the witness, and that's not allowed. So that's kind of where that argumentative comes in. The other one you hear often is, um, this isn't really an answer, this is a narrative. And so when you have a witness who is um, <clears throat> being asked questions, when you have a law enforcement witness, oftentimes you will say, like to Officer Hermosillo, Officer, tell me what happened when you arrived on the scene. And then what happened? And then what happened? And you just let the officer tell the story. But you can't get into either the defense attorney giving a narrative, because then the defense attorney is testifying and not just questioning and eliciting information. And you can't allow the witness to just sort of go off on a on, on telling a story. So sometimes you get those objections. We've heard a couple of those as well. Um, uh, this is narrative, it isn't questions. Um, once again, that's kind of a gray area of, of, um, uh, uh, of an objection it, it, it within the rules of evidence. I mean, there are some rules of evidence like hearsay. It's like here are, it is hearsay and here are the exceptions and it's gotta fall within an exception. But there are other objections like argumentative or cumulative that are a little bit less, a, a little more um, fuzzy around the edges. So, but the rules of evidence are important in trials and they're really important in death penalty trials because it's the rules of evidence that determine what evidence comes in, what witnesses can say and can't say. Um, and what's relevant, what is uh, the, four, the whole idea of 403B uh, uh, evidence, uh, evidence of someone's character or their prior bad acts, all of those things are extremely important um, as the case goes along because they protect the defendant's right to a fair trial. That's what the rules of evidence are there for, is to protect the defendant's right to a fair trial so that the evidence that comes in is evidence that is relative and probative and not prejudicial, because it cannot be more prejudicial than it is probative. There's your evidence lesson for the day. Hi, Curious Cat. Do you have confidence in Melanie Gibbs' ability to be a credible witness? And eh, not sure. Um, I mean, she was relatively credible at, at Lori's trial, but she also did not have real assertive cross-examination. And I guarantee you, John Pryor is gunning for Melanie Gibb. He thinks that she is the pivotal witness and he is gunning for her. And um, she is not gonna be treated gently as she was last time. So, uh, I mean, there, that's, it, that one is going to be the cross-examination to watch. Um, that's the one Pryor has been, has been preparing for, for, for from the beginning. So I don't know how well she is going to do um, under withering cross-examination. She was able last time to kind of just get up and tell her story and Rob Wood just kind of led her through her story, and Archibald and Thomas didn't really have a lot to poke holes in her in her story. I think that you're going to see a very different cross coming from John Pryor. I guarantee that. 
So that one could be fireworks. I think it will be interesting to see whether or not he calls Melanie Pulowski or uh, Ian Pulowski. I mean, certainly they had much more relevance to Lori because Melanie is Lori's niece. But I think it will be interesting to see whether they call her and, of course, whether or she observes the exclusionary rule like she didn't last time. So um, I suspect they may not bother to call her. I don't think she, she really had much to lend to Lori's case. Uh, and she was related. They were able to get what they needed out of Ian. So, TC, if a medical examiner has come to the conclusion that Tammy's death was by asphyxia, why is Pryor trying to bring new witnesses to try and discredit that? Seems like the wrong place to try that. No, I, I think this is exactly the place to try it. Um, so, what I would from the defense standpoint, what I'd say is it's really easy. As I said earlier, it's more difficult to, um, to, to prove that Chad wasn't involved in a conspiracy because a conspiracy can happen from anywhere at any time, okay? You can't say I have an alibi for a conspiracy because a conspiracy can happen anywhere, anytime. That's why I thought it was ludicrous that they talked about, for Lori, they talked about um, that she had an alibi because she was in Hawaii when Tammy died. Well, so that doesn't mean you didn't conspire uh, to kill her. So um, a, a conspiracy, uh, an alibi is useless to a conspiracy. But I think the, the so it's, going to be simpler for them to poke holes in we know you know you can say we, it, alex cox was completely responsible for murdering both the children he can claim he wasn't there he didn't help he wasn't involved however that comes together it's much more difficult for him to say i wasn't responsible for tammy's death because he and garth were the only two people in the house so either Tammy died by natural, coincidentally died from natural causes, or somebody else came in the house and killed her while she was in bed next to Chad Daybell. And he slept through it. So, so I think Chad doesn't have any choice except to say, to find ways to discredit the autopsy. Now, the medical examiner did say autopsies are more difficult on exhumed bodies because they've been embalmed. You don't have body fluids, you don't have tissue samples, you don't have the same level of, of uh, assurance. However, the medical examiner was very clear that the, the foam that, um, that everyone testified that came out of Tammy's nose and mouth was because she had been asphyxi asphyxiated. The, the medical examiner said the bruises that were present on her chest and her arms were from her being restrained. They happened at the time of, the, uh, of her death. They were just before or contemporaneous with her death um, because of the condition of the bruises at the time that he looked at them. So there, there's, I mean, there's a number of, of reasons why the, the medical examiner gave that evaluation. They're going to bring in somebody else who's going to try and discredit that autopsy. They're going to say, the only thing they can say at this point is what Lori said in her allocution, that this is somehow some um, use of a, a fatal side effect of medication. And so I believe that is going to be their claim, is that she had a fatal side effect to medication and, and that it is simply coincidence that she died. I don't think the jury's going to buy that, but that's their best defense. And remember, they've got to find a way to raise reasonable doubt and poke holes in the state case. I don't think it flies, but I think that's the best, the best of, of bad facts. Um, it's very difficult to say, well, 
you know, I was sleeping in bed next to this woman, but I didn't kill her, but she's dead. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, yes, the medica, the jury, this is, this is what juries are for. They are the finder of fact. So the jury has to look at the medical examiner's testimony and the testimony of their expert and decide which one is more credible, which one they believe. And they decide which is the more believable evidence. I happen to think they're going to think that the evidence the medical examiner presents is more it is more credible. But we'll have to see because we haven't seen that testimony yet from, from their expert. So these are all great questions. I love the fact that you all are so conversant in the case and, and um, are so interested in the legal intricacies and and how the how the trial is coming together i love that it makes me think <clears throat> rachel gamber will john Pryor be death penalty qualified after this case that's a really good question so here's the way this works in the state of idaho if you get a court appointed attorney that attorney has to be death penalty qualified, meaning that they have to meet minimum adequate, uh, minimum standards, minimum uh, qualifications um, that the state sets. And that's because the state's paying and they have the right to decide who their service providers are going to be. If on the other hand, a person retains a private attorney, they're responsible to vet that attorney and decide whether or not that attorney is fully qualified. So John Pryor, because he was retained, was not required to be death penalty certified. Okay. John Pryor said he could have gotten certified and chose not to. Usually what that means is that you have to have at least tried a death penalty case before. And if you are being certified by the state um, in order to um, be qualified to set, sit first chair as the leader, as the lead counsel, you have to have sat second chair um, and have been the assistant counsel on at least one case. So um, I would say uh, that John Pryor likely could be death penalty qualified after this case because he will have a death penalty case under his belt. Whether he chooses to do that or not is a, is a different story. I do not know what is in John Pryor's mind or in his future, um, but I will see where he goes in his career after this. So I think technically he could if he decided that he wanted to do state paid court appointed cases. Um, I'm here to tell you they are not the most lucrative cases in the world. And um, so, uh, oftentimes, attorneys will take a few, but they also do retained cases because their retained cases sort of underwrite um, their public defense work. So it's a good question. I Unfortunately, uh, the states do not pay uh, public defenders what they pay their prosecutors. It's criminal. A lot of public defenders in a lot of states make about half of what the states pay their their prosecutors. I think it's getting better, but it's there's a long road. And it, it's had to get better because people are not are not going into public defense because they don't pay and they can make so much money. They can make much better money other places. Ratia Tangmane, I'm sorry. I'm not very good at this. Um, forgive me if I have butchered your name. But hi, anyway, will the insurance company retrieve the money back from Chad and his kids as he transferred some of the money to some of his kids? By the way, I wish you can sign my pre-order book, but I live in, um, that looks like England. You know what? I will be signing book uh, um, plates, um, adhesive book plates that you can put in your book. So... Um, as time goes on, uh, I will let people know how you can get an autographed uh, and personally inscribed book plate. 
Um, I will be doing that at CrimeCon because the book won't be on the shelf until September. CrimeCon is in the end of May, 1st of June. So we're going to be signing book plates for anybody who can show me that they have ordered. Um, uh, by the way, I want to say that my uh, publisher is very happy and excited about all of your pre-orders. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it more than you, you know. Um, I want to, uh, once I answer this question, I am going to give everybody an update on the book launch team. Um, if you uh, have got a recent email from me saying, welcome to book launch team, you're in. There are 106 people in the book launch team. And um, I will go on to talk a little bit more about what's going to happen with that. But let me answer this question first. The insurance company. So when an insurance company insures a, a, a person, it's a contract between you and the insurance company, the insured person and the insurance company. So it, it's up to the insurance company to bring a civil suit if they feel that, that they um, were defrauded. And they were defrauded because Chad murdered Tammy for the insurance money. So the criminal case goes forward. Let's say Chad is found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of having committed the insurance fraud. Then that can be the basis for the insurance company to bring a civil suit to try and recover the money that Chad got. Here's the problem. Chad is indigent. He has no money. I guarantee that whatever little money he passed on to his children is also gone. Um, most of the money was spent on their lavish lifestyle in Hawaii and, uh, and on lawyers. So that money is long gone. Chad has no assets, so there, it, the insurance company gains absolutely nothing by suing Chad Daybell. It's possible that the insurance company could say, you know, could file with the criminal court and say, hey, we want restitution, um, and the judge could order restitution, but once again, Chad has no assets. He's going to be in prison until he dies. So there's nothing for the insurance company to go after. That means the insurance company is really just throwing good money after bad. They're paying their lawyers to file suit against Chad in a civil suit that they can't ever get anything out of. Um, Lori never owned a home. She always rented. She has no assets. She's got nothing. Um, there's no evidence. I, I mean, uh, I, I just, I don't see it. I don't see any insurance company making that business decision to go after, um, to go after money that just isn't there. So it doesn't make any sense for them. And, you know, let's face it, insurance companies do factor in to their business model um, the idea that there are going to be illegal or fraudulent claims. Um, I mean, that's just kind of factored into their business model. If there's going to be a certain percentage of those claims, I mean, it's sort of like in retail, retailers presume there's going to be a certain level of shoplifting or shrinkage, as they call it, inventory shrinkage. So um, I think it's the same with insurance companies. Good question. I just don't think there's ever going to be a, a way to um, uh, for to for an insurance company to cover that. So let me talk quickly about Book Launch League before we close, because I don't like to keep you past two hours, and we've been a little past two hours now. So um, Book Launch League. So here's the deal. I'm an old dog trying to learn new tricks um, because I still need to get figured out the platform for how we have a private chat because I would very much like for us to have a private chat on Saturdays about what's going on in the trial um, just for the book launch league. Um, that's been a little more complicated to set up in YouTube than I expected. So I'm gonna keep working on that, but I've been going to the trial. And so I haven't necessarily had 
time to sit down and work through it all. Um, so, but stick with me because I'm going to. And um, being part of the book launch team means that you're going to get some exclusive content, stuff that w- and an opportunity to to um, have conversations about. Um, about what's going on in the trial and ask questions and um, in a more kind of smaller setting and, uh, you know, be able to get a little one-on-one time. So that's coming. I just got to get it figured out. Um, And then uh, there will also be some other things coming up as we get along closer to the trial. I just got my copy edits back from my uh, publisher so the next round of edits. So that's also on my plate in the next few uh, couple weeks, and then um, and then I'm going to be doing the updates to the book for Chad's portion of the trial. So I've got a couple more chapters and um, complete chapters to write, and a couple more um, chapters I need to finish or supplement once Chad's trial's over with. So that part, once that's done, and we get the final. PDF that will go to the printer to to create the book, you all will get that PDF. So you're going to get an advanced digital copy of the book and be able to read it in advance because I would love for each one of you to post a review for the book. Reviews are like the lifeblood of authors. What we know is that if I get to 60 reviews on Amazon, I get I start getting into the algorithm that starts recommending the book to people that come up on their page. So it's super important to me that we get to that 60 review, which is why I'm willing to send out these advanced copies of the book. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm excited for you all to read it. I'm really proud of it. Um, it's, it's been a, a four year project and um, I'm happy with it. I, I, I think that um, I, th- I think that you all will I think that you all will gain a deeper understanding of the case and the people involved um, because of the work that uh, has gone into the book. And I'm excited to for you to read it. So with that, folks, I am going to say good night because we've been at this for two hours. I want to say we had 340 odd at one point in the chat tonight. So thank you so much. I know that you all could spend your time, your Wednesday nights, a lot of different ways. And I never lose sight of the fact that you're here with me. So thanks. And uh, I I really want... um, That is really a good point, Jen. Homework from Jen. If you have Hulu, watch a few episodes of Boston Legal with David Spade and William Shatner, and you might just get John Pryor. I would echo that. Um, uh, that's, that's really funny. So I want to say thanks to everybody for joining us. If you are part of the Replay crew, thanks for taking the time in the Replay crew. Please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't. And I will see you next week, uh, same time, same station. I hope, um, for those of you who are in the book launch team, that I will see you on Saturday. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that I can figure this out. Um, I'm not an IT whiz, but I think that given enough time, I can work through it. So thanks, you all, and good night.